This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. So the lesson for today, Ben, is that Ireland is an incredible country to visit. We had an unbelievable experience. We landed in Dublin, rented a car at the airport, and driving on, you know, being sitting in the right side of the car, driving on the, the left side is just so strange and, and totally exhilarating to drive there. People drive really small cars. So I look like Mr. Bean in this little car, but it was a normal <laughs> sized car for there, which makes you realize that the cars we drive here are like really big. Mm. And and Lisa planned out our trip to basically do a clockwise tour from Dublin all around the coast of the country and going up to, we had a wedding in Derry up in the northern northern ireland and wow we just experienced so much beautiful countryside pictures do not do it justice um simply unreal absolutely unreal but to drive there basically anything goes and you can't go the speed limit you cannot keep up to the speed limit you're going down roads where apple or google maps whatever tells you to take this road and you're looking really we take that road where like there's hedges on the side of the road that are hitting both mirrors and we're driving a tiny car and they've got these little spaces where if there's oncoming traffic you pull off these little jut outs that are maybe every 500 meters or something but you're going on these roads like 80 kilometers an hour and you're just full tilt you can barely keep up it's unbelievable and you're on the wrong side of the road and you're driving a little car it was just a blast it was un- unreal views we stayed in a place get this she found this uh bed and breakfast on top of a pub up in northwestern Ireland near Donegal where we're in this 350 year old pub we're upstairs in this pub where you walk through the pub you get to your room and you look down on a cliff overlooking a beach that is every bit as nice as a beach you'd see in California you just and there's nobody nobody there it's just crazy we were able to drive on the beach so total blast highly recommend Ireland for what it's worth to people as a destination and it's not too hot. Cool. Yeah. How was your week off? Uh, it was pretty good. I, it was only like <laughs> off in quotation marks because I, I, I had to prepare for the uh, conversation we're having with Ralph Kojin later this week. I wanted to send him the questions last week. So I, I spent some time doing that. His research is pretty intense. Uh, but awesome. I did. I did. I did take some uh, full days off and half days off. Um, we also found beaches that looked like they could be in California and they were only about a 20 minute drive from really from where I live. So, uh, you don't, you don't necessarily have to go to Ireland to find those, uh, nice sandy beaches. Oh, well that's the other takeaway too, right? Why, when you're in Ireland, are you, are you okay driving six hours? Whereas here we would never hop in the car and drive six hours. I'm sure there's beautiful coastlines all up past Quebec city and wherever else. So there I agree are. with you. But you don't even have to go that far. Like there, like you can go forty-five minutes from from downtown Ottawa, and there are beautiful sandy beaches with nobody on them. <laughs> but why don't we? It, it it is amazing. We don't. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I know. That's what I, I. That's what I kept joking that to, to my wife that we don't. But before we go on any international trips, we should drive five minutes down the road, and we uh, we finally did it, and it was great. And as I told you, like our whole discussion around awe sometime earlier this year, it it. It's true. When you step up on some of these spaces and look out, it is truly awesome. It takes mm-hmm. your breath away. How the different hues of greens in the countryside and the brick walls everywhere. Like, how do they build all these brick? There's thousands of miles of hand-built brick walls that are like hundreds of years old everywhere. It is awesome. Yeah, it's cool. Very cool. I, I wanted to mention that it, it took us two years and four months after we launched the podcast to hit 1 million downloads. Remember that was a milestone. Yeah. I'm sure we talked about it on the podcast back yeah. then. And this year, uh, it's been, well, we've, we just hit that. So in, in under eight months, uh, just under eight, eight months this year, we have hit um, a million downloads for the year. Yeah, it's amazing. We used to kind of hover around 2,000 downloads a day, plus or minus. And now when you look at the charts, it's always around 5,000 a day on an average day. It's nice. Yep. Kind of cool. Uh, on the, the crypto podcast continues to get uh, interesting commentary. 
I mean, geez, I thought, you know, talking about dividends was, was controversial, but um, clearly we've been talking about more controversial, controversial <laughs> things recently. Uh, the interesting thing about the crypto podcast is that the, the commentary that we get is uh, extreme, extreme, extremely positive and extremely negative. On uh, Nick Weaver's episode that we had a couple of weeks ago, we literally had two two comments that were uh, complete opposites. One one was saying that they were like a long time uh, Rational Minder listener, and that this was the single best episode ever, not just in the crypto series, but the single best episode ever. And then we had another person commenting the same thing, <laughs> not not replying to the first person, but just a completely separate comment saying that they're a long time listener. And this is the single worst episode that we've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just funny to see. I don't know. Um, I could see how Nick rubbed some people the, the, the wrong way yeah. uh, with his level of conviction. Um, but I, I still think it was a good conversation for sure. Uh, we, we have continued getting a lot of comments about the lack of pro crypto representation on the crypto series. I would say that's more of a reflection on crypto than it is on our ability to find people who are cro- pro crypto. Um, but, but anyway, uh, we, what we're going to do to try and alleviate some of those concerns, uh, and we do have some people who are uh, pro blockchain at least. I'm not sure whether they're pro crypto currencies or not, but that's something we'll have to figure out when we speak with them. Uh, but in the meantime, what we're going to do is re-release the half of the conversation that we had with Cam Harvey about crypto and DeFi. Yeah. Uh, I, I re-listened to that episode and he he's very passionate about it very very positive about it total overhaul what did he say it's not a not a renovation of the existing financial system it's a complete overhaul or something something to that tune uh and i think it's also important to remember so we'll that's that's a rebroadcast that we'll do in the crypto series it'll be part of that um playlist or whatever um and and i mean i I re-listened that episode like i just just said and there's lots of stuff that i hearing it for a second time after hearing the previous episodes, uh, eight episodes or whatever we've done on crypto, it was a different experience. The first time we talked to Cam, that was like, we were very, very low knowledge on that topic. We read his book on DeFi, but we were really coming from a place of, right, we, we didn't know anything. Um, <laughs> we read the book. <laughs> right, we read, we read Cam's book and tried to ask him questions about it, uh, but after, learning what we've learned in the crypto series to date and then re-listening to the Cam Harvey episode or the crypto portion of that episode. It's a, it's a whole different experience. So yeah. even though it's a re-bro- rebroadcast, I do recommend people uh, take the time to listen to it if, if they're partaking in the crypto series. I, I also want to point out that we had Marco DiMaggio uh, on to talk about crypto as well. And he was right in there. Like You, you want a pro crypto person. He was right in there with Terra Luna, which by the way, imploded. Um, not necessary reflection on Marco, but well, uh, anyway, so you want pro crypto representation. We had it <laughs> interesting outcome, at least for one of those guests. Uh, yeah, anyway, so that, that'll be the next, uh, crypto episode. And then we, we've got a few more left in the series before it reaches its, um, yeah, completion. So some, sometime this fall, it kind of will end, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And the next, next probably couple months we'll we'll be out of episodes and then we'll we'll do a final kind of wrap up episode together so as you mentioned next week ralph koijin will be here finance professor from chicago and then in three weeks jay van babel is here he's a professor of psychology and neuroscience at nyu and co-author of the excellent book the power of us so if you have time check that book out ahead of that conversation then in five weeks you booked uh colleen Amerman, who is the director of gender initiatives at Harvard and co-author of the book Glass Half Broken, Shattering the Barriers That Still Hold Women Back at Work. And I just started that book this weekend, which is full of data and information about so far that I have read about women in the workforce. It's a really interesting, um, incredibly insightful book. I agree. I agree. I'm looking forward to the conversation with her. Excellent. So we had a bunch of reviews. Quite a mixed bag of reviews lately, I think it's uh, fair to say. Well, this past week, this is the first time that we've had reviews that were not five-star reviews to read out, right? And it's the first time ever? Yeah, I, I, we don't skip any. Like, we don't just cherry-pick them. 
Uh, Since we've been reading the reviews out at least. I don't know if we've always right. done that. But we're, we're going to keep them shorter. We did talk about that, but we're not going to avoid the ones that may be less than fav- favorable. And this week, there were a couple less than favorable ones. So we got a one-star review uh, from Clue saying, overall good, but the crypto episodes are super annoying. Feels very spammy. You know, a one-star review is not very nice. Like, seriously, I don't, I don't like seeing that. Um, <laughs> and to say that you love our content, but the crypto episodes are annoying, therefore you get a one-star review, it's just kind of mean. Like, come on. Then another one, two-star review from VT Market Order saying, mixed bag, many of the recent episodes feel like empty promotional opportunities for the guests. I hope this changes, and it can. I know the hosts are capable of turning this around. So just so you know, all of our guests, we invite. Like, we're not, we don't, do like people that are on the circuit promoting books necessarily. So if it happens to be a book or an author, we reached out, we read the book, we reached out to the author and invited them on. Or, you know, a few people were introduced to us by Katie Milkman, which we talked about on the show. So that's where people who, come who from. Who are our recent guests even though? I don't know. Fama? <laughs> Didn't talk about it. Auntie, uh, Auntie Illman. We, did, Illman. We, we talked about Auntie's book. Yeah. Auntie was, uh, anyways. John Just List. John List is an author. We talked about his yeah. book. But I mean, you're talking to impressive people. Impressive I think people so. tend to have written books. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, to counterbalance those two, we have a five star review from GM twenty seven thousand. The most important show I listened to. Thank you from Ottawa. I've been listening for about a year and a half now and I've enjoyed your common sense investing on YouTube as well. As I tell my professional colleagues, once you hear Ben and Cameron, you cannot unhear them. You cannot go back to mutual funds, active stock picking, high fees for closet indexing, dividend investing, or paying any attention to daily market noise. So that's nice. Um, yep. Another five-star review um, from A. Sobering in the States. Entertaining, insightful, and actionable. Take that. Do you want to read the last one? I was going to say, you just read two in a row so that I would read this one. <laughs> got to, this is another uh, one-star review. Uh, and they say that the podcast is deteriorating. Uh, it used mm. to be a decent podcast about money, uh, but recently veered into gender ideology and social activism, uh, recently being the last two episodes, I guess. I guess. Or, 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 or two of the last three episodes which is destroying the credibility of the hosts and PWL Um, for folks who claim to be grounded in academic rigor and research, preaching ideological dogma is quite the contradiction. And so people should pick their episodes carefully. According to this reviewer. We're just trying to learn. We're just trying to share what we learn and have interesting people on. I'm not sure we have ideological dogma to preach, but, I don't think so either. <laughs> we don't put that much thought into it. Uh, <laughs> um, recent contacts. Some really cool people have reached out lately. I uh, had a really nice note on LinkedIn from Valtteri, who is a software engineer in Stockholm. He said I could mention this. He wanted to thank us for the research, which has helped him and others in this profession to, and I quote, deal with things like options or other forms of equity where we can end up with a windfall. And he feels very secure with his decisions. So it's great to hear from Valtteri. Also heard from Drew, who owns a RIA, independent advisory business in Boise, Idaho. He says we've helped him shift how he communicates with clients, and he's been spending more time talking with clients about happiness. Kind of cool to hear. He's also launching a podcast soon and has asked me to be um, a guest on an upcoming episode, which is kind of cool. Also heard from Garn, who's changed career paths and is now an assistant to an advisor. Super cool to hear from him. Uh, also connected with Igor in Portugal and Mohammed in Ontario. Uh, connect as always with us. Uh, we're on Instagram, Rational Miner on Instagram. So much fun. Um, also, where did that snack video? I asked you about this. We got this snack video that showed up in our YouTube feed, which is actually pretty hilarious our expressions I, that the team pulled out about snacks and I, I had movie clip and that. popcorn is pretty pretty funny so anyways if you follow us on youtube you'll see i guess perhaps more little videos like that and apparently i make funny facial expressions when ben says things that might be a little off the wall um so this I week for things, the, i never say things that are off the wall well i guess that's debatable i don't know <laughs> you're pretty cut and you're more cut and dried about 
snacks at movie theaters than I was. Mm. Um, so for the reading challenge, a 22 and 22 reading challenge that we have going uh, this month, we have a, a friend of ours that is joining us to talk about his reading habit. His name is Mark Sutcliffe. He's an entrepreneur here in Ottawa, media personality, which is how Ben and I met Mark years ago. We used to have a, it was every Saturday radio show we did with Mark. And we did advertising on the radio. Yeah, we did it for a long time. We did the college Jeez. show. So Mark's been a very good friend of ours um, for a long time. So he, he agreed to come back. He's a local business person. And he's also, since we invited him to come on the podcast, he's thrown his hat into the race to become mayor of Ottawa. So we had a brief chat with him about that experience. Um, he also, up until running for mayor, ran the podcast Digging Deep. I was a guest on that back in episode 82. Mark was a guest of our very early in our podcast back in episode 18, Ben, if you can believe it, almost four years ago. So that, that was a really fun conversation with Mark about reading. Um, the last thing I'll throw out there in this intro is that don't forget there's those little beverage can cozies in the store, two for $15. I love cozies. If you have a pool, you know what I mean? You have to have cozies for your beverages. So get your cozies. Yep. I, 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 I just want to say on the reviews, if anyone wants to leave a review that's not a one-star review, um, we'll, we'll even take two or three stars at this point. Um, <laughs> we, we always appreciate them. What does that mean? We're so desperate? <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of a joke. Only, only kind of a joke, though. Yeah. They don't upset us. We just kind of scratch our heads more than anything. <laughs> All right. Let's go to the episode. All right. All right. Welcome to episode 211 of the Rational Reminder Podcast. All right, I'll be quick with a book review this week, but it is a very good book and a very important book. And it uh, dovetails with a discussion a couple of weeks ago about Cal Newport's book, Deep Work. So this week's book is called The Fearless Organization, Creating Psychological Safety in the Workplace for Learning, Innovation, and Growth. So... As we talked about two weeks ago, deep work is about how important it is both for you as an individual as well as for the organization that people be able to engage in deep work. So this means being able to structure your time at whatever cadence works for you. And we talked about different strategies to be able to get into deep, thoughtful work in a creative space in your work environment to solve important problems. So this was about the individual. This week's book, again, by Amy Edmondson, um, is about the organizational role to benefit from deep work and what has to happen such that what you come up with in your deep work can be brought back to the team and the team can accept it and use it and benefit from it. And this is a, a big deal that we're learning. Uh, I've been learning a lot more about. We have been in our company as well because you're so reliant on everyone to engage and have ideas and have the ability to have this deep work. But how do you pull the ideas together. How do people feel comfortable bringing those ideas together? And different people have different experiences, different confidence levels that you need to have an organization. That's why it's called the fearless organization where people are comfortable in sharing and engaging and bringing forth and challenging ideas. That is what this book is about. So the author, Amy Edmondson, is a professor of leadership and management at Harvard, and she studies teaming, organizational learning and psychological safety. So that's the backbone of the book is psychological safety and how to have an organization that embraces psychological safety and creates an environment where you can engage, bring your ideas and know that you're safe for doing so. So psychological safety, uh, she defines it as a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes and that the team is safe for interpersonal risk-taking. So right at the front of the book, the author says that nearly everything we value in the modern society is the result of decisions and actions that are interdependent and therefore benefit from effective teamwork. And it's pretty powerful stuff. And what's really interesting about this is that if you don't speak up, it's never really known. So this is all about teasing out people, what's in their heads, what they're thinking, so the team can benefit from that. And effective teamwork absolutely requires uh, psychological safety. And as she says, it's a critical source of value creation in organizations operating in a complex, changing environment. 
But brain science, she says, has demonstrated that fear inhibits learning and cooperation. This fear, so it's all about taking the fear out of the organizations that you can benefit from what everyone is learning from their deep work. So the experience of having a question or idea but not feeling able to share it can be deeply unsatisfying. And it's a serious risk factor in any company facing what she calls VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, which is so much of, of our, our, our workforce these days. So it's a really cool um, story right near the front of her book where she talks about uh, research she was doing where she found that better teams were making more, not fewer. They're making more mistakes and less strong teams. And the correlation, she says, was statistically significant. So she wondered, how is that possible? And then she talks about this eureka moment where what if better teams had a climate of openness that made it easier to report and discuss errors? The good teams don't make more errors, they report more errors. So that's kind of the crux of what you're trying to get to. Okay, so as I normally do in these book reviews, I try to make it with some takeaways for you. So here are the common issues in workplaces today that can lead to people not sharing or collaborating as much as they could or should. Number one, avoiding behaviors that might lead others to think less of us is pretty much second nature in most workplaces. The free exchange of ideas, concerns, or questions is routinely hindered by interpersonal fear for more, far more often than most managers realize. The failure of an employee to speak up in a crucial moment cannot be seen. It is hard to improve what cannot be seen. So you have to assume that stuff is not being said. And more and more of the tasks that people do requires judgment, coping with uncertainty, suggesting new ideas, and coordinating and communicating with others. I think that is the reality for many of us in our day-to-day -day jobs. So through the book, I captured all kinds of comments that she made about psychological safety. So here's a list of some points around psychological safety. So it's present when colleagues trust and respect each other and feel able, even obligated, to be candid. And this is a big deal where you really want to engage and have people feel like they owe you a dissenting viewpoint because that makes a decision better. It's likely that different groups have different interpersonal experiences. In some groups, it may be easy to speak up or bring your full self to work. In other groups, speaking might be experienced as a last resort. Psychological safety is shaped by local leaders in the individual groups, in the individual teams. It's not necessarily organizational wide. She has found that psychological safety levels differ substantially between different teams and groups in an organization. She says it's not about being nice. In fact, you could say it's the opposite. Psychological safety is about candor, about making it possible for productive disagreement. Get this, this is interesting. She says it is not an introvert or an extrovert thing. This is because psychological safety refers to the work climate, which affects people with different personality traits in roughly similar ways. In a psychologically safe climate, people will offer ideas and voice their concerns regardless of whether they tend towards introversion or extroversion. I thought that was really interesting. So it's not about your ability, your desire to connect as an introvert or extrovert with others. It's creating an environment where you just feel like you, you owe it to the group to speak your mind. Another interesting point, she talks about how it's not about lowering performance standards. So she says it's very common to have a very high performing group with low psychological safety. So she's saying, don't bring down the standards. She says, bring up the openness to make it psychologically safe to, to get people to speak. Um, psychological safety enables candor and openness and as such thrives in an environment of mutual respect. It means that people believe they can and must be forthcoming at work. And this is absolutely essential to unleashing talent and creating value. People have to be in workplaces where they're able and willing to use their talent. People want this as part of satisfaction. So what can you do if you're leading an organization? What's the solution? What can be done? So you want speaking up to become routine, psychological safety and expectations about speaking up must become institutionalized and systematized. Leaders of organizations must recognize that psychological safety is mission critical. 
when knowledge is a crucial source of value. This one I love. Conflict should be taken advantage of more as it promotes better decision making and fosters innovation because it ensures consideration of different viewpoints. So ask questions like, what did the dissenter say? And so often she says, people said, ah, everyone's on board. Well, then the pushback is, well, then you guys aren't listening very well because there has to be a different point of view that's worth debating. You have to tease out the dissenting opinions. They're always there. Always find the dissenting point of view. Um, she also says we can learn a lot from um, Ray Dalio's Bridgewater hedge fund, which you know, is very popular with you know, radical candor and that whole uh, way of behaving at work. So she says, be direct to the people who are there. This is what Bridgewater does. If someone's not there, don't talk about them. They don't get the benefit of getting that feedback about themselves. So wait till that person is there before you give direct feedback about them. So no, no back, back channel talk about people. Leaders must be comfortable in saying, I don't know. This goes back to the book, Humbitious, we talked about. And saying, I don't know, plays a powerful role in engaging the hearts and minds of employees. Leadership must become a force that promotes unnatural acts, like speaking up. To many people, speaking up is completely unnatural. Taking risk at work is unnatural. Embracing diverse views is unnatural. That has to change in organizations. So leaders in those VUCA, you know, the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous businesses who understand that today's work requires continuous learning, have to figure out when and how to change course, and must consciously reframe how they think to, to bring the best out of everyone and to be more productive. Last point she gives is to become much better at, she calls it inquiry, just ask more questions. Learn more about the issue, learn more about a situation, Learn more about the people that are, are party to that discussion. Understand what's motivating them. Stop assuming you know everything and seek to learn more. So that's, that's what the book is about. Create a place where people can speak up, engage their ideas, show what they've learned from their deep work. Be better for the company, better for them, and better for everybody. Highly recommend this as a read if you're leading an organization. Very cool. All right. I wanted to touch on uh, an interesting paper, and I think we'll probably do a more expanded topic on this in the future, kind of readdressing the index fund bubble, which we, we covered, I don't know when that was, a while ago. But between uh, Ralph Cogen's work and <clears throat> this paper, I think there's a lot more to talk about on the concept of an index fund bubble. This is not a, a Cogen paper. Uh, so this was in the Journal of Financial Economics. Uh, the paper is just called On Index Investing. Um but the premise of the paper is that if, if index investors are free riding off of the information production of active managers, then more index investors should lead to less information in prices. That's a pretty common uh, thing that I think people are used to hearing. Uh, they make a th It's a pretty in-depth paper. This is a, a very brief overview. I just thought it was interesting to mention. Uh, the theoretical prediction that they make in the paper uh, it pr predicts that the, the rise of index investing will have no effect on price efficiency, and they do test that uh, prediction empirically. Uh, the intuition is that in equilibrium, a decrease in the cost of index investing leads to more index investors and less active investors, but because investors always choose to gather information when it is profitable, the mix of publicly informed, that's people who just invest based on publicly available information, and privately informed investors, privately informed being the investors who are willing to pay a cost to uncover information that is not currently uh, public, and that's not like inside information. Right. Um, uh, that 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 uh, mix adjusts such that the returns to active investing remain unchanged even as index investing increases in uh, in magnitude, and so as a result, price efficiency remains unchanged. Uh, to empirically test the prediction, they look at the effects of index investing on information production and price efficiency using variation in Russell, Russell index membership uh, as an exogenous shock to ownership by index funds. It was a pretty inst interesting instrument that they used to, to test it. Uh, and overall, their findings suggest that higher index investing leads to significant changes in investor composition and information production, but index investing does not affect price efficiency, which is what they predict theoretically. 
um, the treated stocks in their in their sample do not experience any difference in variance ratio tests post earnings announcement drift or anomaly pricing. Uh, so they find that following an exogenous change in investor composition, um, they, they find evidence that the mass of active informed investors adjusts such that the price informativeness is unchanged. Okay, so give this, what's the bottom line in English here? Index investing can grow a lot and people will uh, pay the additional cost of uncovering more information so that the level of information and prices remains the same. And one of the arguments we've talked about many times is the strong remain. Yeah, I, I think that's that's the, what Fama and French have always have always said. Uh, something like that, something like that. So and in, it's in, always in, worth investing in the strong that do remain. Is that kind of what this argument is? No, that's what Lubosh Pastor talked to us about a while ago. That if it, th there could be a point where there's a reversal and, and active management does add value for a period of time, um, whether you could time that I think is a is a difficult Wait, question I, th I think we talked to Lubosh about that anyway it's just an, it, this was an interesting paper with an interesting empirical approach uh, that showed over this period I think it was tw 2005 to 2016 is what they were looking at uh, so yep. over a period where index investing grew pretty substantially um, they did not find evidence of price informative informativeness decreasing over that period which is pretty interesting and then you combine that with Ralph Kojin, which people will hear soon enough when we release that episode. Um, again, it's it's kind of similar. What, what we've talked about in the past, that um, big index funds don't have as much influence on prices as active, um, active managers. Cool. All right, you wanted to follow up on the gender discussion. Yeah, I did. I didn't. I didn't set out this year to become like a you know, gender activist that that definitely wasn't the intention, but we had, we had that episode with Rebecca Walker and, and based on the, based on the response, I kind of realized, wow, this is, this is a topic that, that people clearly need to hear more about. Um, and, and people want to be heard on, I think is, is another piece of that. So we, we ended up, d despite getting a lot of really negative, toxic comments, which we were not expecting, like to be clear, we didn't bring Rebecca Walker on as a guest because we wanted to poke some bear. We, we didn't know there was a, a, a bear. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca was, was recommended to us by a past guest who we have a good relationship with. And they said, you should really talk to, talk to Rebecca. And we thought, Hey, it'll be a, a, a good change of pace and a uh, different type of content. And anyway. it was appreciated by a lot of people like Lisa, as I told you really enjoyed well, right. it. Right. Right, so that, that's what I want to say now is that despite the toxicity that, that, that stemmed from that episode, which was completely unexpected and unintended, uh, we, we also heard from later um, women, people of color, uh, and people from disadvantaged backgrounds uh, who, who were very grateful for, for yeah. that episode, um, which was in stark contrast to the toxicity that we received from, uh, I, I can't necessarily say from men because I didn't identify them, but people who have usernames on the internet that resemble men is, is where most of the toxicity came from. Uh, but then people came forward to us generally in private by email or direct messages or whatever, saying how much they appreciated the episode. Yep. When we did our follow-up in episode 209 and we said, okay, part of the problem people had with the episode with Rebecca is that there was no data. So we said, okay, here, here are the data supporting many of the things that, that Rebecca said. After that, we got a lot of support, uh, again, mostly in private and mostly from women saying how much they appreciated uh, our, our efforts in pushing back against the toxicity that the episode 208 produced. So a couple of the comments uh, I loved how you followed up on the Rebecca Walker interview with data and talked it through balanced and informative and totally and re reinforces why you're a great financial advisor. Uh, another one, this one was on Twitter. I was already a huge fan, but I am now a forever fan. We need more people of influence standing up to that toxicity. Uh, another one, I can't remember where this one was from. Uh, as a woman listener, as a woman listener, I appreciate you both as men responding to the criticism and addressing it honestly when you didn't have to raise the issue at all. It's true. We didn't. Again, that was a, <laughs> it was a bear. We a bear. We didn't realize we were poking. 
Uh, that alone will help women who are listeners feel like they are being heard, understood, and can become part of the financial community. Um, thank you for this episode, Ben and Cameron. As you said, the reaction to this episode highlighted how important the topic is. Kudos for standing up to something so important and for fighting ignorance through your content. And the last one I'll read, I'm not a woman myself, but I come from a disadvantaged background and some things Rebecca Walker talked about rang very true. Your environment and upbringing has a lot of effect on your personal relation to money and can uh, can take away even the possibility for you to think about finances. Now, in the fallout, I'll call it, of those two episodes, um, we had a lot more women sign up to the community, uh, particularly after episode 209. Um, and again, I'm basing that on the usernames of people. I guess they could be trolls posing as women. Um, hopefully not. Yeah. Um, but I did notice that more more women usernames signing up to community after episode 209. Uh, we also had a few people leave the Rational Reminder community um, because they had, I mean, overtly sexist views that were not being tolerated by, by the community or the moderators. Uh, so I, I can't say that I'm upset about them them leaving. Uh, overall, d- d- despite all of the, I don't know what you call it, drama, I guess, that stemmed from those episodes, I think it was a good outcome for the community of listeners because it, it seems to have made uh, women feel more welcomed, uh, which is a which is a good thing. Uh, we, we, as you mentioned earlier, we do have an episode with Colleen Ammerman, who is an expert on this topic, booked. Uh, she's the director of the Gender Initiative at Harvard Business School. And her book that you mentioned earlier, Glass Half Broken, it details how despite lots of progress, women are still underrepresented in positions of power and status. Um, The highest paying jobs are the most gender imbalanced, uh, even in fields where the numbers of men and women are roughly equal or where women make up the majority, leadership ranks are male dominated. Yeah. Uh, The book was published in 2021, so it's recent. And it details the, at that time, and probably still, latest research in psychology, sociology, organizational behavior, and economics on what creates these imbalances and what we can do to reduce them. So it's like, it's got the data, which we like, and it's also got actionable insights for both men and women, uh, which uh, we also we also like. Absolutely. Well done. Okay. Stocks for the there's long your, run. There's your dose of social activism for the day. <laughs> or I, I, ideology coming out. <laughs> oh, I think that's so funny. I don't have very many opinions because um, it takes time to form them. But I, I, I guess I'm forming an opinion on uh, on that one. Yeah. All right. Stocks uh, for the long run. Big topic for today. Stocks for the long run. Dot dot dot. Question mark. Um. We've, we've kind of talked around this in past episodes, but uh, th- there is a, a really good paper that I wanted to, I wanted to go through, um, a couple of papers actually. And we mentioned it in the last, uh, the last episode too. So the, the data that everyone talks about for the most part uh, is US market data from 1926 to present time. And that's the Ibbotson SBBI data that's been available for a long time and the University of Chicago crisp data. Both of those you're getting 1926 start point. Robert Schiller's data, Robert Schiller's data goes back to 1871 and in Jeremy Siegel's stocks for the long run books, he goes back to 1802 for U S stocks. And those data mostly are where we get insights like stocks return, 10% 10% per year nominal or about 7% real on average in the long run. Um, yep. That's where we get the insight that stocks always beat bonds given a long enough time horizon. That's the stocks for the long run argument. And that data is also largely where we get the idea that the correlation between stocks and bonds is generally pretty low. Um, I think that the formal view that stocks are superior to bonds for long term investors or even less risky for long term investors was formalized and and popularized in Jeremy Siegel's 1994 book, the first edition of his book. It's currently on the fifth edition, I think. Um, I've got that one, the 2014 edition. Uh, Stocks for the Long Run is the title of the book. And I I think it forms the mental model that a lot of investors use to think about the relative expected returns of stocks and bonds, but also the absolute expected returns of stocks, like that 7% real um, number. 
But the, the problem with drawing those insights from those data is that there are some pretty serious problems with that historical record, at least in terms of how well it generalizes to uh, expected returns. Um, so I, I, as empirical data have continued to evolve and improve, the arguments in favor of stocks for the long run have deteriorated. Hmm. So we, we've talked about this in the context of the dimson marsh staunton data, which go back to 1900 for a bunch of countries. We've also touched on some some theory on on how stocks may be riskier in the long run, but there's this paper by Edward McQuarrie. Um, it's a working paper. It's un, unpublished as of now. Uh, it's titled Stocks for the Long Run, Sometimes Yes, Sometimes No. Uh, and so what McQuarrie does in this paper is corrects the data, Siegel's data. So he goes to Siegel's data sources uh, and parses through them and corrects some errors like survivorship bias. He talks about things like failed railways and canals uh, being excluded from the data. Hmm. There's one large bank that made up a, a, an enormous portion of the stock index at one point in time uh, that was excluded completely. It was a bank that failed uh, or, or had its price declined substantially that was not included in the index. Um, on the bond data, they were using bond returns inferred from uh, yields, I believe, as opposed to actual observed bond returns. So he goes and collects all of the actual data. Um, and he, the, the, the paper is kind of a, a, a triumph of the digitization of historical records. That's one of the things McQuarrie mentions is that these data just weren't available previously. And he's also very careful to say that none of this is a knock on Jeremy Siegel, who had pioneering work on these topics. It's a knock really on the, the availability of the current quality of data when he published his work originally. How did you find this paper? Uh, this paper was shared by somebody in the Rational Reminder community when we were discussing stocks versus bonds for long-term investors. And I skimmed it then, <clears throat> skimmed it a few more times, um, but I'd been wanting to do an episode on it for a while because I hmm. think it's, it's got some really interesting uh, <clears throat> insights. The other thing Macquarie does is extend the history back a bit. I mean, Siegel went to uh, back to 1802, but the data was of relatively poor quality, according to Macquarie. So he improves the data quality, but also pushes the time series back to 1793. Um, Okay, so investors are used to seeing charts with stocks increasingly outperforming bonds over long periods of time. Um, and if we go back to the 1900s, which is like the Dimson Marsh Staunton data and all, all the other data that we mentioned at the top of the segment, um, which it, it's really the 1940s, that's, that's where the big boom in stocks um, happened. So if you go back to the 1940s, stocks have outperform well if you go if you do go back to the 1900s stocks have outperformed bonds substantially and it appears if you look at the chart that they've increasingly outperformed them over the full time series but one of the things Macquarie talks about in this paper is that that's uh, when, when you look at that growth of wealth chart over time it's a bit of a, a, a trick not a not a trick um, it, 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 it's it's hard to see what's actually going on in the data when you look at the growth of wealth chart over a long period of time for example, it's hard to see that all of that outperformance happened basically from the 1940s to the 1980s. Um, but before then and since then, stocks and long-term bonds have performed at about parity. Um, so that, that 1940s to 1980s period, that, that was the historical anomaly. Um, the rest of history mm -hmm. looks a lot more like the last four decades. We tend mm -hmm. to think the last four decades were the anomaly because interest rates went from being really high in the <coughs> 1980s to really low now. But if you look at the the full time series before that, before the nineteen forties, it looked a lot more like the last um, the last forty or so or so years. Uh, so one one of the other things Macquarie does to avoid the the confusion of looking at that growth of wealth chart is that he looks at rolling periods, um, so you can get a feel for sort of the approximate odds of one asset class outperforming the other at various time horizons. This is also something that Jeremy Siegel does in Stocks for the Long Run, where he shows that uh, over longer holding periods, the probability that stocks beat bonds increases. Uh, so in the two 2014 edition of, of his book, which I have, uh, he shows that stocks beat bonds 91.2% of the time for rolling 30-year periods from 1802 to 2012. So that's where you get the idea that like, okay, well, stocks are clearly not risky for long-term investors. You're much, 
you, you've got a higher probability of losing in bonds and stocks. Uh, but using the updated and corrected data, Macquarie finds only a 68% win rate for U.S. stocks over bonds at a 30-year horizon. Hmm. And as a big knock against the stocks with the long-run concept, where the longer you hold, the higher your probability of success gets, at the 50-year horizon, uh, he finds the same, 68% uh, win rate. Hmm. But one of the important observations that Macquarie makes in the paper is that there are some long periods of time, and Macquarie calls them regimes, where the trend goes in the opposite direction. So with stocks tr- tending to underperform bonds more frequently at longer holding periods. Uh, so I think it was the 1794 to 1862 period, I, I, th- I think, uh, where, where that happened. So the trend goes in the opposite uh, direction. Now in the most recent data, so 1943 to now, it, it, it looks like what Siegel found. Um, but it's it's not obvious that, that that relatively short and anomalous period of a recent history generalizes to the future in terms of thinking about expected returns when it's very different from the from the past. Uh, so again, Macquarie mentions this idea of regimes where there are time varying regimes in in returns. Uh, so, sometimes stocks do tend to beat bonds at long horizons and increasingly so at longer horizons, but sometimes it's the other way around. Uh, and the problem is at, at any point in time when you're sitting there trying to think about what your expected returns are, we don't know which regime we're, uh, we're in. Um, one of the other interesting observations that he makes in the paper is that there are no regime toggle switches. So there's no specific trigger or event that we can look back on and say, oh, that's when the, the regime changed from mm-hmm. stocks to bonds. Um, he... he this is a quote from, from him in the paper. He says, sometimes stocks win, sometimes they lose. Sometimes stocks prevail only briefly, sometimes for runs of a decade or more. Sometimes stocks fall behind bonds only briefly at the <clears> depths <throat> of a bear market, while at other times the disadvantage is sustained well past the bottom. And importantly, um, across the centuries, there does not seem to be a positive mean value to which the stock advantage over bonds consistently reverts. Okay, so so, so far all we've done what we've done is looked at an improved and extended U.S. data series on both the stock and uh, and bond sides. If we extend this analysis to international data, I, I think it further strengthens strengthens the argument against the stocks for the long run concept as a as a universal truth. Uh, coming back to Dimson Marsh Staunton data uh, from 1970 to 2021, the World X U.S. So just taking U.S. stocks, which, as we know, have been exceptional uh, out uh, and U.S. bonds. Uh, world X U.S. stocks and world bonds have both returned about 5% real. Stocks are a little above. Bonds are a little below. Um, multiple individual countries have had extended periods where bonds trailed stocks. Japan's the example everybody knows about. Uh, but stocks have trailed bonds since the 1960s in Austria, France, and Italy. Um, it's pretty interesting. Macquarie draws on another source. This is the other cool thing about this historical analysis is that Macquarie had some sort of proprietary data that he pieced together. Um, but there's also the, the Dimson Marsh Johnson data, which we know about. There's also the global financial data database, um, which we did a demo with a while ago. It's a very interesting data. So Macquarie draws on that too. Uh, they've got data going f- uh, back to 1700 for Great Britain. Uh, and broadly, those data confirm the U.S. findings that Macquarie talked about that we mentioned earlier, that there are long-running regimes where bonds beat stocks. Uh, the returns following World War II are an anomaly, not, not seen before or since. Uh, and it's important to understand that there are multiple outcomes that, that can result in stocks uh, trailing bonds. So, for example, over a given period of time, bonds can be relatively strong and beat stocks for that reason, even if stocks did well, or stock returns can be relatively weak uh, compared to bonds. It's like stocks over a period can be strong relative to their own history, but still underperform bonds if bonds are even uh, stronger. But that uh, experience of unusually strong stock returns combined with unusually weak bond returns that occurred following the end of the Second World War, which informs that 
common perception of uh, how stocks behave relative to bonds in um, you know normal times. Uh, that that had not previously occurred in 300 years of of data. Isn't that interesting? Not not to that extent, right? Uh, an- another important observation on international stock returns is that contrary to the U.S. experience, most countries have experienced a negative 20-year real return. More than half have experienced a negative 30-year real return, and a third have experienced a negative 50-year real return. So kind of stated simply, the, the U.S. experience of stocks being safe at horizons beyond 20 years does not generalize to other countries. Hmm. Um, now, for the most part, the worst returns are, are recorded when a country is defeated in war, uh, which the U.S. hasn't been, and that's one of the, arguably one of the reasons that their stock market has been so successful for as long as it has, is they've been victorious in in war. Uh, the next lowest returns are for countries whose territory is invaded or occupied, uh, which again, obviously hasn't happened to the U.S. In, in, in other analysis, Dimson, Dimson, Marsh, and Staunton exclude the losers of World War I and World War II, and excluding those countries, they find seven countries with negative returns spanning between 20 and 40 years, and five additional countries with negative returns spanning between 40 and 60 years. Um, so the, 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 the regime switching that appears in the data where stocks beat bonds for extended periods sometimes, but the reverse is true other times, makes it difficult to rely on historical data without predicting which regime we're living through, which again, I don't, I don't think we can reasonably do. A good example from the McQuarrie paper is, is U.S. bond returns from 1793 to 1942, uh, an, an analyst looking at many, many decades of historical U.S. bond returns would not have predicted the collapse in real bond returns that followed, uh, followed 1942. And uh, I think uh, on a similar line of thinking, the relatively extreme outperformance of stocks compared to bonds in the U.S. from 1926 through 1982 would not have predicted their parity performance since. Hmm. Uh, well, that's for for X X U S stocks. But if you just looked at the, if you looked at stocks U S stocks from nineteen twenty six through nineteen eighty two, you would not have, you would not predict that um, uh, globally stocks and bonds would have similar returns. It's so uh, interesting to step back and take such a long, much longer term view of things and realize that maybe a hundred years of data or whatever it is that we're using largely isn't the entire story. I know. I don't really know what to do with this either because we still have to make assumptions about expected returns. Yeah. So it's <laughs> now one thing to note is that these data, Macquarie is using long term corporate bonds. Dimson, Marsh, and Staunton are using long term government bonds. So in portfolios, we're not using long term bonds. So I think just on that basis, we can still assume there's a difference yeah. in expected returns. Um, anyway. The, the, the other thing that's interesting in this paper is they talk about the, the historical correlation of stocks and bonds. Um, which is varied widely over, they looked at 20-year rolling periods. It's been between 0 and 0. 0.9, which is, I think, an even higher number than when we've talked about this in the Dimson marsh Staunton data. Um, the modern era, since the early 1900s, has had lower correlations, about 0. 0.3, uh, which, again, is where we get the idea that there's a low correlation between stocks and bonds. Uh, the prior 130 years had a stock-bond correlation of 0. 0.6, on average, but like much higher sometimes. Uh, so I, 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 one of the big takeaways here is that the outperformance, the extreme outperformance of U.S. stocks relative to bonds since the early 1900s does not generalize either to earlier U.S. history or to international data. Um, I think that's a, that's a big takeaway. Macquarie argues that there's no law concerning the relationship of stock and bond returns, but each asset is exposed to different risks that are rewarded under different conditions, which can last for decades or longer. I think that's a pretty interesting perspective. Um, when I hear that, it seems to highlight the importance of looking past the basic definitions of stocks and bonds and pursuing multiple independent risk premiums, which is obviously something that we talk a lot about. I think given the data that we've, that we've covered so far, it's, it's, it's really important to consider uh, multiple sources of expected return. 
sticking with the theme of very long-term data, there's another paper, Global Factor Premiums, in the Journal of Financial Economics. It looks at 217 years of global factor premium data across four asset classes. <laughs> uh, right? Of course cool. it does. Yeah. Uh, so they looked at uh, 1800 through 2016. They looked at trend following, momentum, value, carry, seasonality, and betting against beta. Those are the kind of a- AQR factors. And, and these were um, some AQR people, I believe, that wrote the paper. Uh, they find that most premiums are economically and statistically significant over the full period and that there is limited out of sample decay. And they also find that none of the global factor premiums are strongly correlated to global asset class risks. Now, of course, there are many competing factor models. Like we don't talk a whole lot about uh, carry seasonality or betting against beta, for example. Um, but the, the general theme uh, that there are systematic common factors that can be systematically exploited in, in low cost, uh, strategies to deliver premiums independent of the, of the market. I think that's, that's common among any factor models. And of course, value is, is common between this paper and, and the factors that we tend to talk about. Um, and then of course, in that paper, they are supporting that this approach has worked at least in the data. And it's a whole other question of whether, uh, anybody collected those premiums, I guess somebody, somebody had to, uh, but whether they were investable, I guess, is the, is the question. But anyway, they were there in the data. Uh, and I think that's important given the regime switching effect observed in stock and bond returns where stocks can do poorly for a very long periods of time, but so can bonds. And you don't know, you don't know what you're going to, uh, to get. So of course, adding more independent risk premiums in a portfolio makes a portfolio more resilient to whatever macroeconomic effects end up driving returns over a given period of time. In the recent data, this is kind of fun analysis to do. Um, in, in the more recent data that I mentioned earlier, uh, with Japan, Austria, France, and Italy, of stock markets that have trailed bond their their respective bond markets for decades, in some cases as far back to the 19, as the nineteen sixties. Uh, so I don't I don't have data going back to nineteen sixty, unfortunately, for those countries. But for Austria, I do have data from nineteen eighty seven through twenty twenty one. Over that period, Austrian equities trailed Austrian bonds by an annualized 37 basis points. Austrian value stocks, just using the high book to market sort from Ken French's website. Austrian value stocks beat the Austrian stock market by more than 5% per year over that period. Hmm. So very significant uh, value premium. And that's that's not a long, short portfolio. That's the high book to market sort. Uh, from 1975 through 2021, French equities beat French bonds by a relatively modest 1.21%, but French value stocks beat the French market by nearly 2% per year over the same period. Uh, Japan, we've talked about this example many times, from 1975 through 2021, Japanese stocks trailed bonds by an annualized 34 basis points. Japanese value stocks beat the Japanese market by nearly 4% annualized yeah. over the same period. Now, the exception to this example, which I think speaks to not only independent risk premium diversification, but also geographic diversification, is Italy. So Italian stocks trailed Italian bonds by an annual as 1.5% from 1975 through 2021, and value stocks actually trailed the Italian market by about 1.4% annualized over the same period. Um, I think it's, it's worth briefly mentioning the, the Lubosch Pastor uh, Pastor and Stambaugh 2012 paper, are stocks really less volatile in the long run? We've definitely talked about this paper in the past, so excuse the repetition. Um, but they explain that stocks are not necessarily less risky in the long run, largely related to the reasons that we've talked about uh, in, in the first part of this episode uh, or this, this segment. So they explain that even with two centuries of data, and they, they are using the Siegel data in their paper, and e- even with two centuries of data, investors do not know the values of the parameters of the return generating process, especially the parameters related to the conditional expected return. Now, this is relevant for investors because when parameter uncertainty is considered, the theoretically optimal allocation to equities decreases. Now, I just thought of a, a really simple a- a- example that's kind of funny. Um, I- if I propose to you an investment you would probably invest a lot in an asset that guaranteed the return distribution. Like you could still get a bad outcome, 
but you're you're getting you're going to buy the return distribution of the S and P five hundred from nineteen twenty six through twenty twenty one. If I if I sold you that that distribution, you're guaranteed to get this distribution of returns. You'd mm-hmm. probably invest a lot in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you'd probably less invest less in an asset that guaranteed the distribution of global returns from seventeen hundred through twenty twenty one. As we've seen, those have been a lot rockier. And you'd probably invest even less in an asset that could maybe give you something like the distribution from 1700 through 2021, but maybe much better or much worse, depending on what you happen to live through. You probably invest less in, in that. I don't know. I just thought it was kind of an intuitive yeah. way to think about it. But theoretically, um, th- that is also true, that when you introduce parameter uncertainty, uh, the, the optimal allocation to equities decreases. Um, so stocks and bonds are both risky assets. Uh, they'll typically behave differently from each other, although less so sometimes because those correlations can, can get pretty high. Conventional wisdom holds that stocks will always beat bonds in the long run, but in historical data, that's not necessarily true, For sometimes for very long periods of time. Um, bonds have beaten stocks for extended periods of time sometimes. And outside of the U.S., stocks have delivered very low returns for, in some cases, decades at a time. Uh, without the ability to predict the future, diversifying into other independent risk premiums that generally offer protection um, from the extended periods where either stocks or bonds do very poorly. Great. Long-term perspective. I hope so. The answer didn't change. Just get some factor exposure. Well, that's just that independent sources of risk and return are important. But also, over long periods of time, you're not... You're not guaranteed a positive outcome. Yeah, you're not guaranteed a positive outcome at all. I, yeah. I it, it, it's it is fascinating to see that that those risk premiums are documented over the same time period where we're seeing there have been long periods of stocks underperforming. Well, hey, there have actually been independent risk premiums that have existed over those same periods of time where we can make those observations. Yeah, I don't know. I guess it's just a different <clears throat> way of re- reinforcing the idea that this this way of thinking about Portfolio management uh, still makes sense in the long-term historical data, even even more so because in, in recent history, so. yeah, we don't have what well, we do. We do we, uh, those examples we just talked through. I think are pretty pretty, pretty important. Like there are countries well. that have underperformed, um, that have stock markets that have underperformed their respective bond markets for for decades, and in many of those countries, Italy being the exception, value stocks, which is just one of many possible factors that you could tilt towards have uh, alleviated that pain. Of course, that can go in the other direction too. Like if you invested in U.S. value stocks for the last decade. <laughs> yep. Yep. But that's part of it. That's part of exactly. diversification. Sometimes diversification hurts. Always. Diversification always hurts always somewhere. Hurts. That's right. All right. So let's go to our 22 and 22 book challenge conversation with uh, our very good friend, Mark Seckler. Mark, it's great to welcome you back to the uh, Rational Minder podcast. It's great to be back. Cameron, Ben, thank you for inviting me. Great to see you guys. Yeah, it's great to see you too. I mean, we have a long history of working together and it's been a lot of fun and it's good to have you back behind the mic. Uh, Before we get going though, Mark, uh, as I mentioned off the top of the show that you are now running for mayor of Ottawa, what has that process been for someone like you who doesn't have a history in politics, right? No, this is the first time I've run for anything. Uh, I've been around politics for a long time as a member of the media, and I've I've followed politics closely, but it's my first time as a candidate, and it's been really fascinating and interesting and fun, and the response has been terrific and very supportive, um, and I'm really excited about where we go from here. So there, you know, before you make a big decision like this, it was a decision we made as a family, you you think about all the ways that it could go wrong and and politics is obviously you know a, a tricky environment it's a competitive environment and and it's um you know more polarized and toxic than ever before so i was apprehensive and anxious about some of that but so far the response has been just really encouraging and and positive and a lot of people have said that the message of this campaign really resonates with them so I'm I'm very happy with how it's gone so far. Good for you, and congratulations for stepping up. It's uh, 
I'm sure it's not easy and I'm sure you're learning a ton every single day as you're out there and, and Ben and I are quite active following you on Twitter and staying in touch and, and, and I can speak for myself. I wholeheartedly support you in what you're doing. So congratulations. And you know, one of the things I've discovered actually is that, um, is, is how different, uh, the physical world is from the social media world. Uh, so, you know, when you, <laughs> especially during the last two years, working, you know, doing a podcast and working with business clients and, and doing, still doing some media work, uh, you can, and doing it all, you know, mostly from home, uh, you can become, uh, you, you can perhaps become confused into thinking that the social media world is, is the same as the world. And then you get out to a bunch of events in the community and you realize there are tons of people who are not on Twitter and they're, you know, what they're saying and what they're talking about is very different from what people are saying on Twitter, which or on other social media platforms, which which is kind of a skewed subset of the entire community of people who are highly engaged and paying close attention to the minute by minute changes in politics. Um, so it's that that's actually been one of the biggest lessons I've learned so far. Fascinating. Hmm. Well, we are here to talk about reading, and I know you're a very avid reader. So, can you talk to us about your reading habit? Sure, I've been a reader my whole life. Uh, you know, I remember reading Hardy Boys books when I was a kid. I think I read all of them. <laughs> um, uh, they're still on a bookshelf in my mom's basement, uh, stacked up in order. They were all numbered. Um, I read a lot of books about baseball when I was a kid as well, uh, because I, I became a very big baseball fan, and that was a great way before the internet to learn about the history of the game. Um, and, and throughout my adult life, I've, I've tried to read as much as possible. Uh, you know, it's challenging as you guys know, when you're busy with work and you're building a business and you've got a family, you know, it can, that unfortunately reading is one of the things that can get put aside. It's sort of, it feels a little bit like it's a discretionary activity and so sometimes there have been periods where I haven't read as much as I've liked to, but, but for the most part, I've, you know, I've been trying to read two or three or four books a month for, uh, for my adult life, uh, you know, roughly one book a week or every second week. And, and wow. it's been a big part of my life. Yeah. That's a lot of reading. Do you read hard copy or, or audio books? Do you have a preference? So for the most part now, I mean, I used to read entirely hard copy and now I would say it's 98% uh, on my iPad. Um, okay. And so I just find um, there's a few benefits to that for me. I know some people still love the idea of holding the physical book in their hand and turning the pages. But for me, I, I love the fact that uh, you can have multiple books on the go and you can take them all with you wherever you go and it's portable. I also read, strangely enough, I read on the treadmill quite a bit. So I really? set my iPad up on the treadmill, have the font size large enough that I can actually read while I'm running. So I've read a ton of books that way, <laughs> especially when I run more indoors in the winter. Um, and the other thing I like is that, a, is, is that a, an ebook is searchable, right? So mm. unlike a physical book, when, you, when you're reading and you, you know, if it's fiction and you're like, who's that character, like this name, when did they come up again? And you can go back and look. Um, or if you're reading a business book or something like that, you can, you can go back and find something, you know, that that's really relevant. And I also like using the highlighter function and being able to search through that and download things later. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot of reasons why I've become, uh, you know, almost exclusively, uh, an <laughs> ebook reader. <laughs> So, so you mentioned fiction, you mentioned, um, different types of books you like to read. Do you have a certain genre that's your favorite? I wouldn't say so. I mean, I guess most of my reading would fit into three categories. One would be fiction. Um, I do like, um, a number of different authors that I read a lot of. I like, um, you know, just really good fiction, well-written, uh, fiction, I like business books, so I've read a lot of those, and I like memoirs. You know, I love hearing people's life stories, so I've read many of those. Um, and yeah, most of my reading would fit into those three categories. How do you decide to read or, or get book ideas? Um, a bunch of different sources. You know, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts um, and uh, like yours and, and uh, get a lot of ideas from that. Um, lots of ideas from friends. Um, I have, 
some favorite authors that I track. And then I also will go on uh, various, you know, newspaper websites, the Globe and Mail, the New York Times, and look for look for suggestions there as well. So I'm sure you have a good answer for this. How do you organize and do you have a system for capturing key ideas from books, especially like the non nonfiction type business books that you may want to apply to your to your day to day business? Yeah, I would say um, the I, the main thing is I have a file in in my computer. It's a Microsoft Word document, and it's called Key Lessons from Books and Podcasts. Catchy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like to be practical about that kind of stuff. Um, and basically, every time I read a book, you know, I highlight the the parts that are of interest to me as I'm reading it. And when I finish the book, I go back and read all the highlighted parts again, and then I copy them into this file, um, uh, where I, where I keep all of, so I've got this files now probably over a hundred pages long of, you know, a page or two with bullet points of the key lessons from, from every book that I've read, um, or every book that's had lessons to share. Um, and then I occasionally go back and, and, um, and reread them. Um, and I share them with others. You know, I, I sometimes will pull some, you know, I used to do before I became a candidate for mayor, I, I was sending out a weekly newsletter and I would, I would share lessons from stuff that I'd read or listened to in podcasts. Uh, I would share that weekly. Uh, sometimes I share it with friends and clients and that sort of thing. So, which I find, you know, is reinforcing the lessons you're learning. If you're talking to other people about them, that's a really powerful way to deepen your connection to those lessons. Oh yeah. That's a, that's a, a very impressive aspect of your reading habit, Mark, that you, that you do, do all of that to internalize the information. Yeah, that's huge. Don't you find like if you, if you read some, I mean, the, I, I don't know what the statistic is, but you can read a book and you can be like, this is amazing. And I'm going to follow all of this, but you know, a month later, you've only retained so much of that, right? It, you just lose a lot of it unless you're capturing it. And the, and really the best way to, to really absorb the knowledge is to talk about it with someone else, which is why book clubs and, and group discussions and, and even just trying to teach some of the lessons to somebody else are it, why that's all so powerful. Do you have any books that you frequently recommend to other people? Yeah, there are a few, I would say, um, you know, a, a few books that have had a big impact on me, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, oh, yeah. um, which is, you know, it's a frequently cited book, but it had a very, very powerful impact on me when I read it probably for the first time 25 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. um, there's a, uh, I, a book I know you guys both like, which is Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Um, I, you know, in that, um, in that, document that I have of key lessons from books and podcasts, you know, there's probably more, more citations of that book than any other book that I've read. I probably transcribed half the book into that, wow. into that do document, just because there's, I'm fascinated by, and I know you guys are too. And we've had, the three of us have had many, many conversations about, about this stuff in the past, but I'm fascinated by how people make decisions and the uh, the flaws in our thinking and the biases and the heuristics and all the little things that change, you know, th we, we think we're all making rational decisions about things, but we're not. And I, I find that all incredibly fascinating. So that's another one that I recommend. And then there's a book by, um, by, um, Dan Sullivan, who has a business called strategic coach, in Toronto mm -hmm. and uh, his co-writer, Benjamin Hardy called Who Not How, which is oh. a great business book that I've read recently that is, um, and it's not, not just a business book, but also kind of a, an approach to life, which is whenever you think of something new that you want to do, a new goal, you have to think of a person who's going to help you to achieve it uh, rather than just thinking you're going to do it on your own by force of willpower. Uh, and, and the best thing about that book that I'll share is right off the bat, they share at the beginning of the book that Benjamin Hardy wrote the entire book. So Dan Sullivan came up with the idea for this book and his who was Benjamin Hardy. So rather than write, try to write the book himself, which he would have never gotten around to because he was too busy, he got Benjamin Hardy to write the book for him and with him and made him the co-author. So that's a great example of who, not how right there. 
I've written that one down. Thanks. So you've written a number of books, including Why I Run and The Long Road to Boston. Does being an author change you as a reader? I don't think it has. You know, I I, when, I was reflecting on that before we started chatting, uh, and um, and I'm in a way I'm glad it hasn't. You know, because I think there are experiences in life that that can be affected by or even spoiled by your knowledge of how the process works, right? So if you've worked in a kitchen in a restaurant, it may affect your ability to go to a restaurant and enjoy a good meal. Or if you've worked behind Mm -hmm. the scenes in theater, maybe it affects your ability to go see a play without thinking about how are they putting this all together and just be lost in the moment and enjoy the art. And and thankfully, I don't think uh, the experience of of having written a couple of books has affected me. Um, I certainly have even greater respect for great writing and just how incredibly hard that is. I mean, I am I consider myself a good writer and a good communicator, but the ability, the fluency that some people have with words is just astonishing to me. And I, I don't even <laughs> know if that's something you can really learn or whether it's a gift that people have combined with with their, with their, you know, knowledge and, and the talent that they've honed. Um, so I, I have even more appreciation for, for how, um, how amazing some writers are. Hmm. What advice do you have for someone who might want to read more? So a couple of things I would say, first of all, uh, you've got to make it a priority. Um, and that's what I tried to do. Um, now I say that um, I'll share with you guys. Like I, by the way, I write down every time I read a book. I write it down. I keep a log of all the books that I've read. Hmm. You know, as you, as Cameron knows, I love tracking things. <laughs> everything has a everything in my life has a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet attached to it. <laughs> so I have you know, and and so far, you know, as, as of June 9th of 2022, I had read 32 books so far this year, which I was pretty happy about. That's a, you know, that's actually a more than I would normally read in the first five and a half months of the year. But since June 9th, I haven't read any books and that, that's because <laughs> I'm running for mayor. So I'm super busy. So again, you got to make it a priority. You got to block off the time. One thing that I did that helped was, was going to bed earlier. So if you wrap up your day and you, you know, if you're used to going to sleep at 10 o'clock and you go to bed at nine o'clock, it gives you an hour to read. Um, combining it with something else, like what I did reading on the treadmill that had a huge impact on the amount of reading I was able to get done. Um, and you know, other people listen to audiobooks in the car or when they're running or that sort of thing. So I would encourage you to do that. And the last thing I would say, which is a lesson I actually gained from running and from fitness is, you know, it run whenever you can read whenever you can, like if you've got 10 minutes, read for 10 minutes. Don't think you need an hour. Uh, you can have a a bunch of 10 and I know it's harder because you want to get more deeply into it, but you might have four or five, 10 or 15 minute windows in the course of a day where you can read that adds up to an hour or so of reading that you otherwise would not have. If you just thought, Oh, I'll wait until I have a bigger chunk of time. And that could be like four or five hours a week that you're now reading in small chunks that you wouldn't otherwise be reading. And that will add up to roughly a book a week, more or less. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Well, Mark, this has been great. A couple of takeaways, buy a treadmill and don't run for mayor if you want to read more. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. That is a great point. Yeah. That should should have been my first piece of advice. Solid advice right there. So um, thanks for joining us. Good luck. Good luck in the race. Thank you both. This has been great. It's been great. So thanks again, Mark. And thanks everybody for listening this week. Thank you.